Hi, this is e Marine Science, section 1.4 in the 2024 syllabus, Tides and Currents. Hi, and welcome to section 1.4 in the Marine syllabus. Today we will be going over tides and currents. Uh, as always, 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 when you do Cambridge, special ITCSE, AS or A level, uh, do yourself a favor and look at the syllabus first because that is what we will be going after. Um, but here you can see uh, the syllabus for section 1.4 in the ITCSE Marine Syllabus. And we will try to go through that here in details. All this is um, from my own class here at Radom Efe School. It's 100% non-profit. Um, but if anyone can use it, you're more than welcome. Now, tides have been known by sailors as long as people have sailed the ocean and we as humans have sailed the ocean since ancient times, the ancient Greeks, Egypt, people in Polynesia, so on. So that uh, water will, will rise and fall um, was known. Um, but what we're doing today is why. And the important thing is to remember it's all about gravitational pull. And it's about two things. It's about the moon and the sun's pull on the earth. So <laughs> if we have the earth here as a basketball and we have the moon here as a smaller ball, uh, the moon rotates around the earth and the earth spins around itself. Now, although the moon is smaller uh, than the earth, it is still a quite dense object, so it has a large gravitational pull. It means that it pulls on Earth and Earth pulls on the Moon. Now, most of Earth is quite solid, so it's not really going to go anywhere, even though there's a little pull in it. But our water on Earth is uh, liquid, so uh, the gravitational pull will pull towards the object pulling here. So here we'll have a gravitational pull of the water that way. So the other thing that has a huge influence is, of course, the Sun. Um, the sun is much further away, uh, and gravitational pull is affected a lot by distance. But since the mass of the sun is also much greater, it still has a huge effect, and it also pulls on the water in our oceans and creates a bulge, which is a high tide. Um, and so, <coughs> if we have the high tide here, then we have the low tide here and here, and we have another high tide on the other side. Here we see another illustration uh, where we just see the moon, but we'll see the moon's gravitational pull uh, create the high tides and the low tide. Now, as the moon position changes, so the tidal bulge will rotate, and also the Earth is rotating as well, so most coastal areas experience two low tides and two high tides every lunar day which is about 24 hours and 50 minutes. So that is why we can create tide maps. So a captain approaching a harbor will know when that harbor will have a low tide or a high tide, which can be quite important uh, when you do sailing. Now, as I said earlier, the moon and the sun both have a pool on the ocean. So when they are aligned, the pool will get much stronger and will get the strong spring tides. When they're not aligned, when they are at an angle to each other, the tide will get less and less strong until we get the weakest tides, the neap tides. So here we see how the combined gravitational pull of the sun and the moon can create either a very strong tide, a spring tide, or the weaker tide, the neap tide. Now this is of course also important if you're doing sailing, knowing when it's a strong tide and when it's a weak tide. And it can also mean some, a lot if you have a storm coming, uh, something else will push water in towards dikes or coastal protection of any kind. So knowing when it's a spring tide and when it's a neap tide will mean a lot to how you will prepare for any given storm. Tidal range is a range between the high tide and the low tide. And geographical um, position will mean a lot. Some places the difference between high tide and low tide is just small, like half a meter. Other places, uh, like the northern coast of France, uh, England, you have a huge difference between the high tide and the low tide. Now, this means a lot for the community of organisms who live there. It means a lot for the local fishermen, for tourism and so on. So all this matters a whole lot. 
when you're on the beach in Denmark, you can usually see the difference between the high tide and the low tide on where we find the remains of seaweed on our sandy beaches. So, gravitational pull uh, moves water in tides. Um, wind then creates the ocean currents. Now, in the IDCSE syllabus here, we don't go into a lot of detail on how wind patterns are formed, but I do suggest it, it's something you have interest in. Look into it, it's super interesting. Um, the new IDCSE syllabus also skips a little bit on the Coriolis effect, which is also highly interesting, but I'm not going to go into detail with it now. Just know that we have wind patterns uh, on our oceans uh, and also on land, which means the wind tends to blow more in one direction than the other. We call these prevailing winds. As the prevailing wind push on the surface water, it creates a surface current. Now, currents tend to go either in clockwise or counterclockwise uh, gyres, depending on if they're north or the south of the equator. As you can see in the map here, we have clockwise currents north of the equator, and we have counterclockwise uh, currents south of the equator. This is also due to the Coriolis effect, um, which is not a part of the syllabus right now. Now, these are surface currents, uh, and surface currents are, of course, important. Uh, they mean a lot in shipping. They mean a lot on how things get distributed. Uh, these uh, gyres we get here also means a lot when it comes to plastic pollution, because plastic pollution tends to get caught in these gyres and are then uh, collected in what we call the ocean garbage patches. We also sometimes see strong tidal currents, and that is when uh, the water moves in and out of a narrow space. Um, and then we are able to see a huge effect on the water moving in and out, uh, which can create quite strong currents, which can mean a lot also for people sailing there, fishing there, or swimming there. So our surface currents are created by wind force and by the turning effect of the Earth. Um, but we also have deep water currents, and that is vertical movement of water due to changes in density. Cold and salty water is more dense than warm and fresh water, so if water cools down, it will start sinking to the bottom. Uh, and when we do that, it creates a push on the water further down, which really moved along like a conveyor belt. So cooling seawater, let sink down, it creates what are called downward currents. And this creates our deep water currents, which move slower than our surface currents, but are still very important for moving nutrients and water around the Earth. So this creates what we call the ocean conveyor belt, which means that pretty much all oceans in on the world is connected. Uh, water will flow in surface currents and then in deep currents, and then eventually when they hit land, they'll become so there's currents again, and when they cool and sink down, they will come deep currents. So this creates this entire ocean conveyor belt, which also means that pollution in one part of the ocean won't just stay there. The oceans are interconnected, and we have, in fact, like one big ocean. Rip currents is something you should be aware of if you do a lot of sailing or swimming on the coast. And a rip current is where we have a strong current going outwards. Uh, can happen on sandy beaches uh, in, if the geomorphology is so that the water will tend to like get pushed in a very narrow canal. And, and if you have that, it's important to know that you can't swim against it. Even the strongest swimmer would get very tired trying to swim against the current. So if you are on the beach and you're caught in a uh, rip current, uh, it's important you swim along the beach. Then you'll get out of the current and you'll be able to get back in.